concerns as usual we're probably going to leave this room potentially even more uh, confused than we arrived which some cases in some cases i'm not sure this is one of those it's a good thing right but we'll see so let's get it started um there is a lot of talking about whether more automation and artificial intelligence will bring about less and less human control right by simple definition more automation means less control but of course on the one hand um, automation is highly desirable right it promotes productivity it reduces human effort and also when, when it's used correctly uh, it improves the quality of operations of what we do um, then on the other hand however we would like to ideally be able to remain in control of this autonomy uh, and this is what I call here the control dilemma, right? Um, but first things first, why do we want or need to remain in control of these intelligent autonomous technology? Um, there's at least two big families, let's say, of preoccupations. So the first family of concerns regards safety. Uh, this ranges from safe operability, for instance, when we deploy systems we don't know very well or uh, that are unpredictable to some extent. And uh, two existential risks, that's, that's, the other, that's the other problem. In the, the whole debate about super intelligence, if you're, if you're familiar with that, we've seen many important authors recently dedicating some serious efforts to this. Um, Stuart Russell, for instance, very recently, his last book, Human Compatible, Hey AI and the Problem of Control, um, talking about these risks for AI. But there's a second family of concerns which regards moral responsibility. So it's something like who's going to be blamed for the actions that are initiated by an autonomous system. Many have um, observed, for instance, that artificial intelligence, especially with regard to certain deep learning techniques, has a transparency problem. In the sense that we cannot easily find the reasons why certain decisions have been taken from the artificial system. Uh, and this makes it really hard to trace back those actions to some human person that's accountable for them. Uh, and also in many cases, even if these persons or person are retrievable, we have troubles genuinely blaming them, right? Either because they didn't do anything intentionally or maybe because they couldn't foresee actually what would have happened and so on and, and, and other reasons like this. So it, it seems to be important for many reasons to remain in control, but we might just not be in luck. Maybe we have to, to give up on that at, at some point since, since we're going towards like increasing and increasing autonomy, right? So many have tried to provide solutions or maybe I should say sometimes workarounds to minimize the issue of giving up human control, especially for what concerns the problem of responsibility. So just, just here, a couple of, of very oversimplified examples here. We have, for instance, those who propose that something like nobody gets uh, blamed, okay? Nobody. We just stipulate some sort of agreement and where we specify who's going to pay, well, legally speaking, and we settle for that. But this approach, um, let me only say that it has been criticized also by myself by, for instance, highlighting the importance of some forms of moral responsibility that should never be dismissed like this. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail here because I want to get to the point and I never do, but as I've, I've been there in other talks and papers on this, and there's actually a forthcoming paper where uh, Filippo Santoni de Sio and I discuss this thing among other things. So well, you stay tuned if you're interested in that. But there's, there's then, let me go to the other point there are others like some of my japanese colleagues roboticists uh, who genuinely give their best shot at making artificial autonomous agents responsible for their actions uh, so and, and they investigate forms of legal personhood um, this approach has sort of frequently encountered criticisms in the form of you know there's something off with 
kicking my refrigerator because my beer isn't cold enough. You know how it goes? It's like this. Uh, but of course, I'm to, to a large extent sympathetic with this uh, attitude, to, to a large extent, not completely, but it's worth considering, of course, that artificial autonomous agents might sometime even soon, eh, even soon, become very similar to us humans, and one might want to be prepared. I think that's what moves this approach, it's the central idea that encourages this approach. But all you know, many believe, and we good, with good reasons, that there's no way to have the cake and eat it, right? So in a sentence, to maintain any sort of human control in the meaningful sense over high, at, but well, let alone fully autonomous system is impossible. It's, it's, it's impossible, just impossible. So if we can control them, it means maybe that they might not be autonomous enough. But in this little talk here, I would like to explore like a few philosophical ideas that come from the tradition and philosophy of free will, mind and action, including a very recent idea of meaningful human control to see if there's anything that might let us have, have the cake, right? We have the cake and at least we take a little bite of it. I don't know, maybe we can settle for that. I will see. Um, some of you may know, and it's been uh, mentioned here already, for the past few years I've been working at deepening and operationalizing this philosophical theory of meaningful human control over uh, autonomous systems, uh, driving systems or was the use case, but the theory itself is neutral to the case, and, and that was developed by Filippo Santoni de Silva and uh, Jerome van den Hoven in a seminal paper a few years ago. Uh, and this theory, this is important, this theory was really devised with overcoming this dilemma between control and autonomy in mind, among other things, but, but this is what I really want to take uh, out of, of, out of this, this idea of meaningful human control, or this theory. Uh, I know that some of the crowd here might think I'm taking them like ad nauseum. <laughs> so they're allowed to switch, uh, switch off the audio for the next few minutes, but I would recommend staying anyways. Uh, so and wait for the, for the twists. Theory, the theory of meaningful human control, this theory sees two conditions, right? For control over autonomous systems. They're called tracking and tracing. Okay, so the degree of human control of the meaningful kind uh, would depend on the degree these two conditions are satisfied. Okay, so mm, the, the tracking condition to the left sets a specific requirement, a property that these autonomous systems should always display if we want them to be controllable by, by human agents, by humans, by us persons. This property is that these systems potentially even complex socio-technical systems, you know, operators, devices, the infrastructures. Um, these systems um, really um, should, should display this, this property of um, covarying their behavior, covarying their behavior, you see the cogs there, with the relevant reasons of the relevant human agents for, for doing things or not doing these things with their intentions, in a way, their will. And the second condition, then we'll go back to this one, actually we'll focus on this. Um, but the second condition is called tracing and it requires several competences from a user of the system. And that means making their, it, it aims at making their involvement in controlling the system as relevant as possible, right? There should be a person, it says at some point of the design or use context of an autonomous system, that has a special awareness of, of its functioning and, and awareness of the moral role that they play in that system. And this would allow, as the word well tracing uh, suggests, to trace the actions of, of a controlled system as effectively as possible back to one or more human persons, humans that were put in charge. So trace back to them the actions of these systems. Now, what you should notice at this point is that these two conditions, they aim at two different aspects of control, right? They have two slightly different, if you will, complementary scopes. The latter condition tracing uh, aims at facilitating um, the possibility to attribute responsibility 
in a way that is fair and just as possible. But it is less, less concerned with the, uh, the nature of the actual interaction between controllers and the controlled system. So if we were take tracing alone as, as a condition for control, so the whole meaningful human control theory would be a oh, normative theory, we've seen several, normative theory about responsibility and accountability, but it wouldn't tell us much about control in the other sense, control itself in the other sense, right? Um, about whatever connects controllers and control systems. So the tracking condition, the first one, is there for this reason. And it requires the system's behavior to co-vary with these certain reasons to act. But, but what's that? What are these reasons, you, you ask, of course. Why reasons and not actions, for instance? So normally you'd want to control lowly autonomous systems with some sort of control panel. Um, you want a system to behave according to the buttons you push. That's, the, that's behaving according to actions, reacting to actions. Not, however, with highly or fully autonomous systems. And one of the reasons being that we're very bad, for instance, at supervising and vetoing. Uh, so reasons to act is a generic way to call human intentions, dispositions, goals, plans, and even values, we have argued. So the idea is that, that a system's, <clears throat> the systems, a system's behavior, simple alignment with those reasons would grant the space for a higher or high degree of autonomy while maintaining also the right degree of moral involvement of control in a way. And therefore, of course, yeah, it's more control. The whole idea is, and yeah, yeah, it wasn't invented uh, as uh, like, it wasn't a fresh start. Uh, it comes from philosophy of mind and free will in general, let's say, or general intuition. Uh, there we have been trying for centuries to sort of understand how mental things, like intentions or reasons, are connected to physical things, like actions. And in particular, very important, free actions. Um, so we're almost there, not yet. You give, give us philosophers another thousand years, maybe two thousand. Um, and we'll, 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 we'll see what happens. But now here's the issue with this. Here's the issue, here's the issue. I said we need autonomous systems behavior to co-vary, right, with human reasons. So there needs to be some interaction going on, right? Um, so these reasons have to somehow cause the system's behavior. Uh, they need to steer it, to keep it on track with our ever-changing mood or the uh, ever-changing, value-changing society, our changing needs. Yes and no, mostly no. There's, there's good reasons why this condition doesn't use words like causing or, or similar words. So reasons, reasons, the reasons are well known to be somewhat problematic causes for action. So reasons are not good causes for actions. Those reasons that should steer, push, to which the system should respond to, right? So not good causes. I, um, Donald Davidson, amongst other philosophers, he discussed this problem at length in the context of, of the mind-body problem. Um, to oversimplify, uh, it, might be, it might be hard to retrieve a strict and well-defined law, like a physical law, right, which binds reasons for uh, an action and the action itself. So this is for some, at least some, due mainly, to the fact that reasons are high level descriptors in a certain psychological language. And this language seemed to be hardly reducible to its physical counterpart, which is of course expressed in a different formal language, the language of physics, mathematics, maybe. So in philosophy of mind, many would settle for this, would say after all physical events 
okay, actually control wants action. That's not what we're denying. They're just too complex and fuzzy to be described effectively in, in, uh, in physical terms. Um, so, to, to, so we use reasons to describe those, uh, those events, those ph physical phenomena. So we use more abstract explanations in a way which we can handle much better. And in some sense, so still in some loose sense, we can say still that reasons cause actions, right? But we have a different problem here because we have to design behavior and not only to explain it. So, so reasons are very good explanations, explanations for auctions, but, but we, have a, we have to take a different, more aware perspective from a step before, design, right? So we need to understand the, the nature of this link between reasons and autonomous systems behavior. And the tracking condition here, as it says, um, that human reasons and the actions of these systems should go hand in hand, should be aligned. It doesn't say whether this is the case because they just always, let's say, happily agree or because they talk to each other. So how do we solve this um, kind of principled problem? So one idea would be to find a way to establish this link that we're missing between a controller's reasons to act and the behavior of these autonomous systems. But then one could think, we have said reasons might be right in some hardly accessible sense in the brain and therefore in some way there are causes of an auction. So one way would be, one way to establish this missing link would be uh, through some sort of, I don't know, brain reading device that's capable of classifying mental states, of interpreting abstract intentions, putting them into action. Um, okay, but um, I think this, this is a little mis misleading and I have some concerns about this idea, ranging from well, technical feasibility to its principled soundness, let's say. I'm gonna be very, very superficial here. I apologize because this sort of deserves a whole talk, maybe longer one than this, but, First of all, from the technical side, we're far away from having a, a functional neuroimaging system, an AI classifier that is sensitive enough to discern the adequate nuances in thoughts and intentions. So oh, achieving such technology might require extremely high resolutions, AI classifiers that are very well smart, very sensitive and as specific as persons at understanding thoughts, I've defended this point in the paper some years ago, but this means very broad and very intelligent algorithms or neural networks. Huh? I'm not saying this isn't possible. I'm not saying this, but I'm just wondering what do we do while we wait for the technology to be at, the, at that point to be invented. And the second concern is also sort of is maybe uh, more, more deep, uh, somewhat more principled. It's about the possible inherent difference between a reason on the one hand and the neural event on the other hand. So we should be, I believe, very careful not to trivialize the notion of reason. Uh, in fact, these reasons, as I um, said before, include, um, include different, different kind of entities, um, like moral goals, motives, and even values. Huh? So it's to these abstract entities that we want a sufficiently free and autonomous system to be sensitive, to respond, to, to align to. So the extent to which these things are in, retrievable in someone's mind, let alone in some interpretable neural event, is very dubious. So these, these entities, these weird entities, these reasons, they extend over time, they emerge at the level of society. And so they, they might just not be in somebody's or more person's head, right? It's not what they are, maybe. So being short of ideas to how to make it, how to make this work, this connection work, this connection between human reasons and systems uh, actions, I, uh, I thought I went back in time meeting uh, Gottfried Leibniz, uh, 
who I thought, you know, maybe I'm reminding of something. So he, as many philosophers of, of his time, he was trying to make a lot of things work, many different fields, he's doing many things. And one of those was the usual, of course, um, working out the relation between our soul or mind and our body and therefore actions, our actions. So one of his ideas was that actually causality might not have been necessary, might be something necessary. He thought God is a very good clockmaker and they designed all things so well that they would forever work in harmony. A pre-established harmony. So any causal interaction between two things would be mere illusion. And these basic entities the world is made of, he called them uh, monads, that's why the monadology of technology here, uh, called the monads, are just, just uh, self-sufficient systems that God pre-programmed to harmonize with each other. Like perfect locks, they, they sort of all run together, but they never communicate with each other or with the designer. And since in, in AI, we really like to uh, play God, I thought this would have been an interesting analogy. But yeah, in a way, in a way, in a way we do, right? So if I keep playing along the lines of this analogy, my question becomes, should we consider at least as like an option to investigate the possibility to conceive control without any such causal connection between controller and control system, which is at least in, in a big part already, already contained in the, in the idea of, of tracking and meaningful human control. But of course, like we have to make exception of this initial design phase. There, there just the contact, right? When we, as uh, like it was for the Leibnizian God, uh, we set things in motion. And what does it mean to design for this kind of control? So I thought another metaphor came to mind. Uh, and. Uh, and let me mention it, it's a silly one, but not so silly. The train, right? So in a way, the train goes where we want, all right? So it does, does what we want, usually. But it doesn't require any additional input to steer. It doesn't require us to constantly intervene to sort of keep it on track with our reasons. Uh -huh. um, the tracks, the railroad, allows the train to be going where we want the whole time it travels. And there are design, design of these tracks, it expresses a very dense history of societal values and moral reasons. So they tell a story about, for instance, politics and the economy and about the people's good reasons to meet each other and stay connected. Moral reasons too. So I understand this is not a good example of sort of intelligence of, or flexibility or autonomy uh, even, but in some sense it might be. But it might also be a good example of control. So should we consider maybe more intelligent and more autonomous systems like trains with very many of those tracks? Is this, is it, can this inspire a little? Could we design, for instance, all of them to go where we want. So we, can we set them up in a way that, that they won't fail us, but they'll be flexible enough for us changing our minds? Could we design those tracks, and this is harder, so to go where we might wanna go in the future in this value changing society, but to never go where we should normatively have, never want to go, so the final question is really, if this is even something, would this be a sufficient for us form of control? Would this be a sufficient form of autonomy as it was for, for Leibniz? Or would this just be another overcomplicated way to sort of to give up anyways on control, autonomy, or both?
I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna leave you with this. Thank you so much because I feel like this becomes a field for designers more than philosophers, and I would love to sort of see if if any intuition or or have I stimulated any thought about it. Thank you so much. And thanks. Thanks. Like this. Great, Julia. Thank you very much. Extremely fascinating talk. I really like it. This, uh, yeah, someone have a question, you can just, yeah, just raise your hand or just say something or just post on the chat. Let me... Or answers, okay. right? Not only questions, or answers to Julia's questions. <laughs> That's what I want. Um, if I may, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'll turn on my camera as well. Otherwise, yeah, it's please. Yeah, I was just looking at a screen for. Uh, I get it. Hello. Um, so let me put you in the right spot. Yes, now I'm looking at you and seeing you back. Um, I, I that second idea, I was. It got me thinking about what is AI to you, um, because I would actually be quite fine with this idea of perfect design being the solution for my trains or my. Uh, dishwashers and other systems, but I might be less fine with it when I'm thinking about, for example, my kids. And, and I have a feeling that I will be somewhere in between that spectrum. Uh, so where would you place AI and how do you think that might relate to this idea of perfect design will be enough? So these, uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much. It's very fascinating. This brings me back to so many things and discussions and free will. So let me, let me give you sort of the, the counterpart that what, it's what we do in, in philosophy of free will, right? There's this whole discussion about whether um, determinism, a, a world that is, that is made of uh, physical laws that have one way to go, right? It's a chain of events. There's no way to do otherwise in physical terms, right? And then when we think about ourselves as much as, so you're our kids, right? Or ourselves. And when we think about, when we think about AI, we're made of the same stuff. We're made of the same thing. We're very similar, right? So the, the, the way, the, the, not the answer, but sort of the, the observation for your question is clearly, um, if we're happy with us being sufficiently free, and we're in a way, even if we're not sort of intelligently designed, but, but at some point we're made in a certain way uh, because of evolution and because of, so we have our own constraints and things we can do, things we cannot do. Uh, our body is made in a certain way. We're trying, we're doing, we're, we're overcoming these limitations daily with technology. That's one of the great things that technology does. Uh, but we have, for instance, uh, the limits and challenges of our cognition that are, are there. Again, trying to overcome them. But if we're happy with us have being constrained, we might be as happy uh, with, with AI. And then, then the, the next question that you made, actually, is, but then are we, can we define ourselves as being under control of evolution? For instance, that's something that sort of, because who designed us, right? And now we design, we want control through non-intervention, through just, just that moment in time at the beginning when we designed this technology in such a way. And we want to call that, we want to see if we can call that control. And are we under control of our own nature? This is Spinoza, by the way, I believe. I believe, I don't know if there's philosophers who want to kill me in this, uh, in this uh, audience, they're welcome. <laughs> yes, I'm this. But yeah, forget about it. Um, in a way, yeah, this, is, this would be what I observe out of your question, which I find very fascinating. Thank you. I cannot hear. Uh, we have a question from Enod on the chat. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, do you want to? Yeah, sure. So, Julia, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm, I, I sort of tripped over the, the last <laughs> remark that you made about are we under control of evolution? So, I, when you say, so before I go to the question in the chat, and uh, I'm sure you can answer this one, but when we say control, do we always assume that there is a controlling entity or can it also be something that is emerging? I think it's, it's emerging. 
I think it should, it should, we should consider that it's emerging. Why because do we what call I that want, control then? Ideally, I'm sorry? Why do we call that control? We might That's be the under challenge. influence, but... That is the challenge. So meaningful human control really is a way, in a way, to smoothen, to, to say it's, it's more like an influence. When you, when you think about, at least, when I think about our theory of meaningful human control, I don't think about that kind of control that is direct operational, but is more like an influence. Would that still be within the boundaries of control? That's your question, which is, which is very good. Of course, what you're saying is, well, why do we call that control? Is that influence? And, and where, does it, where does influence finish and control starts? Right? Do we want to define meaningful human control as a softer form of control? Do we, do we associate control with a sentient being? You mean the controller? Do the you controller, mean... yes, yes. So the, 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 the person, the phenomenon, the whatever, For natural, me, yeah. <laughs> whatever, that exercises that control, whether it's, whether it's control or influence, that was not the intention of my question, but I see your point. But now I'm on that question of, uh, you know, is we this have... deliberate, sentient, etc. I, I mean... I, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Selfish Gene and those kind of uh, books, which I don't think talk about uh, control. But yeah, yeah that, in a way, that book, <laughs> it represents a little bit in our, our terms, like translated in our terms. We've been many times claimed to be the control that is exercised by societal values, um, by the system at large that's made of a lot of sentient beings, but also uh, made of, of these, these regulations, values, intentions, ideas. Are those, those values that maybe we can conceive as controlling the direction of the technology, where the technology goes, are those sentient in a sense, or do they emerge you you used emerge i like that word very much um, okay let me go let me go to the question i put in the, the chat so this discussion about the reasons and actions etc of course is something that uh, uh, humanity has always uh, you know been subjected to in a way right if you go out and get food or if somebody attacks you and you pick up a stick and you kill someone or defend yourself there is this action reason um causality etc but in the past i don't know 50 years 100 years or so suddenly of course we've made that step to interaction with uh, technological artifacts and ai being the the most recent one at a level that we can hardly understand so i was wondering if we discuss the interaction between reasoning and actions let's say in human history versus where we are now do you think they have the same answer yeah i'm not sure if i make my question clear. i'm not sure if I, i'm not even sure if if i phrase it well but so do you do you I'm, see where, where i'm trying to go or or am i did i lose you <laughs> so no then it's not because of you i think i think it's, i'm just trying to digest the, the depth of, okay. of this question. Um, so the interaction between rationality, rational entities, uh, and, and actions, and the world outside, between mind and body, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did it change when we discovered that we could design intelligent beings? Or, or what you mean maybe is, did it change when um, in, in, in the process of interacting with artificial beings, such as AI, artificially intelligent things. So let's say that in the era of the interaction and the design of intelligence, so at some point we discovered that intelligence could be, uh, could be designed, could be created, and we started thinking, look, ah, so we can, we can reproduce what we believed like only God could, could do, right? Or well, whatever other theory you want to have. Um, I believe at that point, what we had was this, the realization that the idea of us being very material things in the world and intelligence being something more tangible, that's what it changed. 
So while interacting or being able to design intelligent things, uh, while doing so, we have had this, this sudden argument for materialism. That's, that's one of the things that it gave us. So um, in the, the debate about whether reasons um, determine action, I think certain explanatory theories such as, look, reasons are just descriptions. The one that I, the one that I mentioned, just descriptions of physical events I think AI and technology helped us in, in understanding better the nature of, of cognition. So I'm not sure this answers. I don't, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I don't think it does. Um, I, I wasn't <laughs> sure what I was asking anyways, but it's, uh, it's uh, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's surely it's very, are very complex and deep questions, so that's yeah, uh, it's gonna always be hard to cover all the points, right? But yeah, I think you did a great job. And we have a next question from Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia, uh, can I read it or would you like to ask it? Uh, to, I can also ask no problem. Okay, I think the video, oh no, there it is. Yeah, Actually, Hi, it works. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I was wondering if there is, uh, and I don't know either how to properly, um. Uh, ask this question either, but um, um, I was wondering if when we talk about the connection between reasons and actions, if there isn't first some sort of synthesis in the reasons, because um, there, there can be different actors. The, the producers of the technology have certain reasons that might translate into, for example, a different connection with the actions and a different meaning or value ascribed to what's meaningful in the meaningful control or even what's control. So I was wondering, and, and then the, the public authorities might have another one, individuals might have another one. So I was wondering if, if when we talk about connection between reasons and actions, if we first also need to discuss that or if that affects that somehow. Absolutely. If I may, <laughs> if, if uh, that was for you, the but, question. So <laughs> um, it's, uh, I believe the one that you pointed out is one of the first in time and in priority challenges of any theory of meaningful human control and control and in the time of, of autonomous technology, defining, understanding a framework of actors and their reasons. Oh, I think this is mostly what I've been trying to do with the past years, actually. Uh, so I'm sympathetic with this point. Uh, to identify and isolate the actors and their motives, reasons, uh, intentions, that comes before, in a way, being able to translate them and find a way, which is, which is what we're talking about here, find a way to understand them as causes or reasons or explanations for the actions of a technology. So this link is the second step after we have really, well, maybe they'll, they'll go hand in hand, but it all starts with identifying the sources, as you mentioned. Then you can design to transform these and do you design and you find a way to explain how they can influence the behavior, influence, I, I'm using Einold, uh, Einold, sorry, um, word because it's, it's correct. I like it very much. So that's the, that's, that's the idea. So yeah, of course, it's, it's actually the, the challenge, one of the first challenges. I don't have an answer. I tried, I, I uh, in, a, in a paper in 2019, I designed this, um, we, with Filippo Santoni this year, with this, this scale of reasons and agents to sort of try to deploy some sort of framework that would, that would relate to reasons and actors in a certain given case scenario. According, ordinated according to the nature, the proximal nature of their intentions. This is a little bit complicated. It's in philosophy of action, but you can identify different kinds, let's say, or degrees of intentions and reasons and actions and even laws and values at some point. I don't want to go there, but just like, we've been trying. Can I, can I ask a little follow-up if there's time? Uh, yeah. 
And, and, and I was wondering because I'm a I'm a jurist, I'm a jurista, I'm a in the oh. law part. <laughs> and uh, and for us, there is often the question of um, uh, balancing values, or um, inevitably, sometimes we stop at okay, we have a trade-off here. So basically, the choice then among these possibly conflicting values is going to be one prevailing on the other. And uh, it, while what I was mentioning before was more is is there because this kind of chops off part of the reasons somehow, but the reasons are going to still stay there. I, I believe what we find often is that the conflict is because these reasons try to re-enter <laughs> the whole thing. So that's why I was wondering, like, is there a possibilities? Are there mechanisms for a synthesis more? more than, than that. I mean, Teubner discusses that a lot and he's one of my personal favorites because for the law, he is particularly <laughs> useful. Obviously. Like instead of just chopping off, treating these things as a trade-off, um, are there mechanisms, are there um, uh, reasonings that actually are more, um, uh, well, yeah, are more of a synthesis or more just including everything from the philosophical perspective, obviously? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's plenty. Uh, this is a big problem in, in ethics. Um, so how to do, to take sort of the, the best trade-offs between values and in your case, norms. Um, but this is neutral and it's a big challenge in itself. It's, but it's, an, it's independent from what you normatively then choose after deliberation, after having identified your trade-off, what you take for your model of, you know, we should follow, we should design for privacy rather than security. I'm, I'm saying something absolutely um, random. But, but the trade-off between privacy and security that has to be elaborated at the prior stage in a different context which is absolutely important it's it's fundamental but you, you sort of it there are two processes different processes connected but and then i wouldn't i'm not an expert in sort of value trade-offs there's many at the udel for sure <laughs> you probably are a much uh, greater expert than i am at this uh so yeah, so, in two weeks from now, we're going to have also uh, Ibo van der Poel. Talk, yeah, the, exactly, for instance, that's one. one of them. So <laughs> if you, please join us in two weeks again. <laughs> we, can, we can get to that conversation. Amazing. <laughs> so, um, and the next question is from Elisa. Elisa, would you like to say or can I read it? Okay, uh, you, you're muted. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I always do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Julia. It's it's really an open question I have for you. Um, I'm, I'm I'm curious at how also based on the conversation we just had, and then I see the next question from Claudia. Curious um, about how you see philosophically as a moral philosopher the difference between control and what we might call stewardship. Um, as an interaction designer, control brings along questions of who is in control and, and who has the privilege of control and therefore is empowered to act, to respond. Um, it, it, it also brings up questions of how can I deal, you know, with, with emergent behavior that might not necessarily be bad. Um, so how do I avoid stifling also um, innovation? So, so I just wonder philosophically, how do you see these two concepts or, or you know, what is a softer version, more responsive version of control, philosophically speaking? Let me, let me take the last thing that you said. It's very, it's very sort of stimulating. Uh, you said something about um, there are emerging behaviors of a technology, is that, would that be correct? of a technology that are not necessarily bad, but they were unexpected and they are out of, they might be, oh, correct me, yeah, we're open, yeah, very much, uh, out of a particular or a, a set of particular controllers intentions, right? Oh, uh, we did not expect this, but, but it's, it's good, but we never 
we never intentioned, we never mm -hmm. did it as controllers. So the, 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 the idea that we tried to sort of um, incarnate with meaningful human control is that going back to, to what we talked about before, um, control doesn't need to be conceived, or at least this is a, uh, a, a proposal. You can conceive control being exercised by values then so they're at the extreme spectrum of the great big scale of intentions and reasons right so these values are not are not persons they represent uh an emerging sentiment which is for instance what you said when you said oh but it's good right we, we never did it in a way, but we did it in another way because that responds to the value of goodness. I mean, this is stupid, uh, but to, to, to make the point, it's a good thing, so it responds to this value, right? Um, so in a way, that is a little bit of the essence of the tracking condition where it says, um, it has to co-vary with the reasons Right? It means going hand in hand, which doesn't mean that if we, if tomorrow what, what I today think it's good, it's still good, right? And that is the problem. That's one of the reasons why we're here today. Because I can conceive control as being this, uh, this alignment between values and reasons and the behavior which is by accident good, so I'm in control, but I'm not entirely satisfied with this because if tomorrow my values change, technology has to immediately switch. That's responsiveness, the way that, that I desire, that I don't obtain really while I'm struggling to get out of extremely fully autonomous Systems. So the idea of you know you know you have these two clocks, they're always so if we change the 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 the, the technology changes because it's all I can foresee possible changes and some of those changes I cannot I don't want those changes so maybe I have a range of ten different choices and any of those might be okay within that range that's that's a design question that I really don't know how to understand I'm sort of I'm thinking along with the better designers. Um, that's, that's what I can say, yeah. Yeah, okay. Great, thanks, thanks. Thank uh, just, let me just correct myself before I said in two weeks we're gonna have Ibo von der Poel, no, in two weeks we're gonna have Steven Umbrello, and in three weeks on the 28th of October we're gonna have Ibo von der Poel, okay? So uh, the next question is gonna be from Claudia. Yeah, yeah hi. Um, Actually, uh, Lisa was right that uh, my question is very much connected to this, uh, to, to, to her question. But I do have a follow up uh, in a sense that um, when we talk uh, a lot of times about control and also here when we talk about control in like restricting um, kind of the outcomes, uh, possible outcomes or, or what we uh, intend for this machine to do, we talk about this idea of like, okay, at the end of the day, I have control, right? But what if we have a system that, you know, kind of departing from autonomous weapon systems, uh, going into the direction of systems that somehow can suggest you where to go. So algorithmic systems or like recommender systems that can provide you with ideas for your course of action. So in that situation, of course, nowadays in like the, the, the public discussion, that would be considered to be in control because you as an ultimate let's say commander, you're able to say, okay, well, this is the recommender system and I have to take the decision to, for example, um, well, flip the, 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 you know, put the gun or whatever you need to do. So from your perspective, would you say that given kind of this framework that you also presented as, do you think that this is, you can also say that the control there applies because you're there at the end, like doing the action, you're actually the doer even though that action may have been influenced in this case by an algorithm that provides you with the decision what to do. And uh, especially in like a very uh, kind of intense situation, you might not even have maybe time or resources to, to double check that. So 
So how do you maybe, you know, how would you deal with that kind of situation and, and control understanding? Yeah, I think we have to, to some extent, accept that our decisions as much as our um, opinions or as much as uh, our design um, ideas or our, the, the way we do the things, they're always influenced by, by something else. So I, I could say, well, in a way, think about your uh, decision to go to a certain university. Was it your decision or was it a decision that was also partially determined or influenced by a number of, of contextual cues, other persons? So, and do you feel that you're in control of your own decisions because of that reason? It's a question, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, I do agree that, of course, all of our actions are influenced. But in a sense, if you especially talk about algorithmic systems or, or systems that, you know, assist in military decision making, then you have two very, two, like, two situations in which first the military decision making of course has a much bigger impact than my choice to go to university and then you also have a situation in which a military system or the, the the system that i have at hand might be influenced by design of an external party so my decisions will not be influenced by the organization or the thinking within the organization uh but externally by other forces so that's kind of the the the, the tough can, can, yeah, 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 absolutely, I understand perfectly. Can you see this, my screen still? Um, Am I still yeah. sharing? It says your screen sharing. Yeah. Yes, we can, can see. You? So, can, can you see the slide here? So, yeah, um, actually, maybe I can play this. Yeah. So, that's, so to, to, to consider the importance of those normative aspects of values like, well, decisions uh, that have high stakes, um, should be taken by humans, humans should be in charge, uh, humans should be ultimately responsible. That is what the tracing condition does. So it's not just about the metaphysical condition of control, the tracking condition that we are in control, but we need a certain kind of, it has to have certain, a certain nature. And what you say is absolutely I share it. I, I'm, I'm, I completely agree with what you say. And those values that you mentioned, in theory, at least, sort of the attempt is that the tracing condition should set up the, the farther normative conditions for a decision, for instance, a military decision where there's high stakes, could be um, meaningfully, genuinely, truly human in the sense that you can attribute responsibility in the sense that, so that is a normative set of 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 um requirements rather than the metaphysical requirement in the in the link the connection control so i agree with you and and that's why we have two two aspects of control taken care of. and you're talking about this uh, aspect on the right uh, side of the screen you, you can put more conditions here. This is one. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. Great. So I think we, we already ran out of time since we had like some problems with all this transition from Jitsi to Zoom. Uh, let's be a little bit more linear. So whoever has to go and other comments, thank you very much for joining us. And let's go for one last question here from Arkady. And then that's it. Okay, Arkady. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, I've noticed that we have a couple of more questions here in the chat. So Julio, if you don't want them to disappear into nothing, you might want to uh, check them. Uh, before we can we send oh, you. Oh, you mean in the chat? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it's just assuming that my question will be the last. So yeah, I have a very practical question, right? So uh, I've been thinking for the past year or so, how do we actually uh, Covary the behavior of the autonomous uh, of autonomous systems with uh, human reasons and exactly the, uh, connecting re reasons and then the actions and the actions we can observe and the reasons we cannot and then yeah it, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that reasons are bad causes uh, for actions so I, I'm not sure I follow that argument but 
I have a very practical question, right? So assume that uh, we can observe these actions and the observations are perfect and assume that we also have some kind of uh, an understanding, maybe not perfect understanding, but some kind of uh, a causal model, if you want, of, uh, of reasons uh, causing actions. And then what we can boil the whole problem down down to is basically causal inference. So we have uh, observations and we have a model, which might not be perfect, but we might want to infer what are the actual reasons behind these actions, given the observations and the model. And then this is something that uh, we can relatively easily formulate mathematically and uh, whether it's valid at all, I'm not sure, but what's your take on this? That um, I think the problem, I mean, there's many problems, but the, and challenges, not problems, challenges, because I like it. Um, but the main one that I see here is it stays at the beginning. And the first thing that you said, well, let's, let's assume that reasons are things that are good enough to be translated into causes, right? Um, boiled down somehow, transformed, trimmed, compressed, reduced, that's the term that we use often, reduced to physical causes. Um, the risk, I am at first, there's, there's several reasons why in, it, they're inherently non-reducible. There's many philosophers um, assume, well, take this as in a way for granted. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Because of, as I mentioned, there are descriptions in a high level language and the language isn't the same. And when you translate it, you lose stuff that you cannot regain. Okay. When you translate the language of psychology into the language of neural events, let's say, well, I say neural events, you could say physics, chemistry, you can go as down as you want. Um, but there, there is a loss of content, right? And the other concern, still in principle, is that it might be also, in, again, in principle, in, in unfeasible, to make, to make justice of what we call values. For so these very overarching emerging entities, are they, do we actually have a way to, to, to find a counterpart in a, in, a, in a language that you can then model mathematically? As you said, now once you have that, then you might be over the bigger problem. But that this is, and this is what philosophy has been doing without success, much success, success enough to help us at least. Um, so far, this is really like, how do I reduce consciousness to physical events? Oh, you, you can, there's many theories um, that I can accept. Maybe we can do it. But we still talk about mental entities in a certain way, in a certain language, rather than another language, because of reasons. There's reasons to do so. Oh, you can ask other philosophers, uh, maybe Patricia Churchland, she, she might disagree with me. I believe that she does. Uh, and so on. But yeah, I, 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 own, I see this as being a major problem. Like you're, you're assuming something that is the actual problem. If you assume that's solved, I'm happy. <laughs> and, and I think yeah, it's easier. Yeah. Uh, Thanks a lot, Julio. I think, uh, yeah, we had some other uh, questions and some I have saved the answer. I will, oh, I can send you, I can, I can save the backlog. I will send you everything. So thanks everyone for joining. Thank you for the very interesting talk, Julio. And thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah? Okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, bye. bye, bye.